Hi everyone. So happy to be here. I have Dr. Dorette Norhassen. She's gonna be joining us here in a second. I'm sure she's gonna be here any second. And we got so many questions. Hi, Dret. I'm gonna bring her on right now. Here we go. I'm so excited for this. She should be here any second, waiting for her to come on. Thank you guys for joining. Feel free to chat your questions. Hi, Dorette, how are you? Hi, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for being on today. Um, let's just get started. But before we do, can you tell our audience where you practice a little bit about yourself? And maybe I see your books behind you. Just tell us about your books. Oh, absolutely. So um, I practice in the Dallas Fort Worth area. I'm a reproductive endocrinologist and infertility specialist here. And um, I'm the medical director of CCRM in Dallas Fort Worth. And uh, one of the greatest things that I've experienced is I've experience what it's like to be an infertility patient. And um, I've met my husband, uh, we met when I was much, much older or much later in my reproductive years. And uh, I myself have undergone five cycles of in vitro fertilization to ultimately create just one good embryo. The pre-implantation genetic testing led to one euploid embryo. And that embryo was transferred to a surrogate. And it's because of an incredibly kind woman who carried my son for uh, nine months that I'm a mother today. So you asked me about my books. I have them in the background. Um, this one is Miracle Baby, A Fertility Doctor's Fight for Motherhood. Mm -hmm. And that's a memoir of my personal life story of what it's like to be both the doctor and the patient and to see it from both sides of the exam table. And um, there's a second story in that book that uh, the second story is my own personal life story of what it's like to have grown up with immigrant parents and be new to America and to ultimately becoming a physician. And uh, the second book, The Fertility Manual, Reproductive Options for Your Family. That book, what I've noticed over the years is dealing with infertility can be a very difficult and roller coaster experience. And what I wanted to do is to write a book that broke down fertility in very basic, simple terms. So it's not a 1000 page manual that that's that sits on your desk and accumulates right. dust. It's a short, simple, easy to read book. And it just basically breaks down infertility. How do you know you have infertility? When should you see the doctor? Okay, you've been to the doctor and they gave you all these long test lists of testing to do. And why should you do all this testing? And then uh, there's um, a chapter on treatment options, IUI, IVF, genetic testing of embryos. Um, there's a chapter on donor egg, donor sperm, and surrogacy, um, because sometimes you have to borrow an egg sperm, or in my case, a uterus. Mm -hmm. um, and the final chapter deals with the psychosocial aspect of infertility. Um, dealing with infertility can be a very emotionally difficult process and leading to stress, anxiety, and depression. And so I address a lot of that in the last chapter. Um, you know, uh, as I mentioned, my husband and I went through fertility treatment and he read the first draft of that book and he said you know he wished someone gave him that book before he went to the doctor because there were times he felt like he didn't even know what was the right question to ask right. and uh, um, you know he obviously is married to me he can ask me anytime but you know it, even someone like that feel, felt like okay if he took a little bit more control of his care and knew what to ask uh, he would be in a better position. So I wanted to write this book, not really to give true medical advice, but more so to empower people to ask the right questions mm -hmm. when they go to see a fertility doctor. Awesome. Well, thank you. And I imagine it's a great book for you to buy for your husband. If you are a fertility patient or for a family mother, member, a mother-in-law, so they know what you're going through. Okay. I have three pages of questions that were emailed ahead for this show. So I'm going to go ahead and start asking them. Here we go. What type of couple would ICSI and natural IVF benefit the most? We're 29 and have had a miscarriage in November. We have no male factor infertility. We want to do natural. I imagine that means IVF. But our doctor suggested ICSI because we're doing PGT and he doesn't want DNA contamination. How do you feel about that? So good. that's a very, very good question. And a lot of this depends on the genetic lab that is analyzing the PGTA sample. And for our, many of them, they require to require ICSI because 
it reduces DNA contamination from other sperm. So um, for the person who um, uh, asked you to, or is asking us this question, with natural insemination, what happens is the embryologist puts the egg and sperm in a petri dish and they go home, they shut the lights down, and allow the egg and sperm to fertilize naturally. But truly one sperm will fertilize the egg, but even if one sperm fertilizes the egg, there are many more to attach to the shell of the egg and the DNA from those sperm can con ultimately contaminate the sample when we go to do the biopsy for the PGTA. So a lot of genetics lab will require ICSI, really, really gives them a cleaner sample that they can analyze. And as a patient, you know, that actually benefits the patient mm -hmm. because they're less likely to get uh, results on their PGTA biopsy that says contaminated or no result or could not analyze. They're get the the uh, lab is getting a cleaner sample and therefore can interpret it and get better results for the patient. So I would certainly recommend ICSI. Great. And is it better to lie down or stand up when you're doing your IVF shots? What do you tell your patients or what did you do? And anything that works for you. I don't think there's any <laughs> right or wrong answer in that. You know, there were, I got to the point I was so busy and doing it, I would have breakfast in one hand and a shot in the other hand. And right. the line that we're setting up, doesn't. it doesn't matter. Um, it's going to get to your body. Got it. Okay. And then this is another question. How does high prolactin affect IVF retrieval and transfer? If my prolactin is high, should I take medication for it? So one of the great things about doing the testing ahead of treatment is to identify abnormalities like hyperprolactinemia. And what I tell patients is that you want everything to be normalized before starting an IVF process. You're going to spend time, money um, going through this IVF process, and you want to start off with a good foot. So what I would say is try to normalize everything. Make sure your thyroid's under control, your prolactin mm -hmm. levels are normalized, your diabetes is well controlled, your blood pressure is well controlled prior to starting. Yeah, great. And then how about rescue ICSI? Is that something that's possible if, let's say, you've done IVF, and there wasn't fertilization, what's the likelihood that rescue ICSI can help a patient? So I've seen rescue is ICSI done a few times um, and it's a last resort. The person was unexplained infertility, didn't have any evidence of male factor, was not planning on doing PGTA and very few eggs fertilized, like a small percentage. And so the mm -hmm. next day, we try to help the patient out by doing rescue, rescue ICSI to fertilize the eggs. There is some fertilization, but the truth is the embryos don't look that great. Um, mm -hmm. We've kind of missed that time window. So the egg goes through a series of windows where it is the right time for fertilization. And once you've passed that time frame it becomes more and more difficult for fertilization. So the few cases that I've seen with Rescue ICSI um, did not work very well. Um, the good news is it was a learning lesson and the next time you go through IVF, plan to do ICSI from the beginning. Got it. So what are some types of things you do for your patients to help their lining thicken? Oh, there's lots of things I do. So the truth is 95% of patients will respond to just your regular regimen of uh, estrogen preparation for uh, lining. Um, but there are a few patients where the lining isn't thick enough. So mm -hmm. things that I do. Um, oral, es oral estrogens, um, there's a lot of what we call first pass effects. So a lot of it's not absorbed as well. But vaginal estrogens work well. Intramuscular estrogens work well. You can do those once or twice a week. Um, Viagra. So Viagra is a vasodilator and uh, doing that vaginally can also improve blood flow to the uterus and therefore hopefully getting the medications to the uterus better and increasing the uh, um, lining thickness. Um, and the other thing, acupuncture. Acupuncture also increases blood flow. Um, so acupuncture is also a great thing to do if you are um, trying to thicken up your lining. Right. And is there a special diet that you recommend for your patients? Everything in moderation. I, yeah. it, it, it's so hard to follow a very, very strict diet. So, and to think about, you know, my patients who are doing this for a few years until they finally get to a positive result. And so I've gotten to the point of where just saying everything in moderation is fine. Um, right. 
So ideally you want to eat foods rich in antioxidants, berries, pecans, dark chocolates. Um, you want to avoid fatty foods. You want to um, avoid uh, uh, alcohol, avoid excessive caffeine, um, increase your protein intake, um, try to stay away from processed foods. Um, once in a while, though, you got to give yourself a, a, a cheat weekend because um, yeah. you just have a, a, there's a, a certain point where you have to live. So right. um, try to do everything in moderation, uh, diet, exercise. Um, it's really all about lifestyle and the way that you live your lifestyle and just uh, um, continuing that daily where that's your new normal. And it's not really a special diet that you're doing. It's really your new normal. Perfect. When do you recommend doing a sonohistogram during IVF? So I typically will do a sonohistogram the, um, either during the diagnostic phase um, or if it's been quite some time since they've had a uterine evaluation the month before doing the transfer. So typically I will have a patient on birth control pills the month before the transfer and then the next month they take some form of estrogens to get their uterus ready. Um, so during the month of birth control pills, they can also do the sono histogram. The reason you do it the month before the transfer um, and not during the month of the transfer is that the catheter you use irritates the lining, irritates the uterus. So you wanna give yourself one menstruation before starting the prep for the uterus. Mm -hmm. So either the month before the uterus, um, the transfer or sometime in a diagnostic phase if that was just recently done. Perfect. So this is a clinical scenario that we had sent in. I'm 29 years old, my AMH is high. I think I have PCOS, that's what I've been told. I want four children. And my doctor said that I'm probably gonna get 14 plus or minus four eggs. Is that enough? Should I go up on my dose of medications to get more eggs? What do you think? So 14 is an excellent number. And at 29, I'm hoping they're very good quality. Um, and so 14 and a 29-year-old, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed for that person that they have quite a few embryos and they're going to be of high quality. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes when you go for higher quantity, you sacrifice quality and you don't want to do that either. Um, the good thing about this person is that she's 29 years of age and a large, I'm hoping a large majority of her embryos are going to be normal. I agree. Here's a question from Norway. I have a patient or uh, someone who's reaching out to us, 40 years old, AMH is 0 0.5, fourth egg retrieval on Monday, got three mature eggs out of four eggs total, got one embryo. What would your protocol just in general be for a patient like that? What, would, what kind of protocols would you use in that kind of case? So there's numerous protocols that I would use. Um, we, standard protocols are doing birth control pills and maybe an antagonist cycle or a long Lupron cycle. For someone with what we called low egg reserve as this uh, uh, lady um, is describing, um, many times I prep them with estrogens prior to starting the IVF. And in theory, we're hoping that the estrogen um, will keep the ovaries nice and quiet. And when their body sees the FSH or the injections the next month, it really wakes up quite well. Um, there's also what's called microdose Lupron. Um, with microdose Lupron, that's used uh, uh, quite a bit for women with lower egg reserve. And that's a special protocol where Lupron is a drug that behaves like what we call an agonist in, uh, um, initially. So it stimulates the ovaries and then it behaves like an antagonist um, where it suppresses the ovulation while we wait for more follicles to grow. Um, some patients I will use uh, either Clomid or Femara in mm -hmm. addition to very low dose uh, gonadotropins or injections. Um, so there's numerous protocols that we can try. And there's no one protocol that fits one specific per one specific phase or um, one specific type of diminished ovarian reserve. Some patients they just do better in one protocol, and you see a patient with very similar scenario and they do better in a different protocol. Right. Um, so it's really at this point it's kind of trying out which one works best for the patient and uh, getting the patient to the egg retrieval. Okay, now I have an egg freezing question. <laughs> I have 57 follicles, I'm 33 years old, my AMH is 10. How worried should I be about OHSS? And what would you do to prevent that? Yeah, 
I think that's great. You have a high AMH and uh, um, you're going to make lots of eggs and have lots of eggs frozen. Um, and uh, we would start you on a fairly low dose, just to, or a dose that's appropriate for your egg reserve. Um, and to avoid ovarian hyperstimulation, we do what's called a Lupron trigger. Um, so with Lupron triggers, you have a very, very low chance of developing ovarian hyperstimulation. And therefore, uh, um, I think it's safe to proceed with your egg freezing cycle and do the Lupron trigger. And good luck and actually applaud that person for freezing eggs and taking a, a control of their care so early on. I agree. Okay, here's a 31-year-old woman who's diagnosed with PCOS. And she's wondering, how likely can I get pregnant with a late ovulation? I'm worried because my ovulation is as late as day 24. Does that mean something bad for me? No. And actually, women with longer cycles, they may sometimes actually ovulate. It's just later. So in a 28-day cycle, the first 14 days are the follicular phase, and then they ovulate, and then the last 14 days are the, is the uh, luteal phase. Um, but for some women with longer cycles, that first portion, that follicular phase could be 21, 24 days, and then ovulation happens on day 24, and then they have the 14 days of the luteal phase. So um, I'm not worried, and I've seen actually women get pregnant spontaneously who thought they could never get pregnant, they never get periods, and then three, four months go by, oh, I never really get periods, and then they realize, oh, I got pregnant, and right. so you can spontaneously ovulate uh, at a later date. It doesn't have to be exactly cycle day 14, 15, 16. It could be later and still be a perfectly good uh, egg and ovulation. Yeah, great. So I have, a question, I have a question here about cold showers and embryo implantation. So she's asking us, I'm wondering what's your view on having whole body cold showers as an immune system strengthening measure? Nothing extensive, just one to two minutes at the end of my warm shower during the two week wait. I was told in my clinic, there's no issue to continue practicing it as long as my body is used to it from the past. However, on the internet, I found other things about how it's important to keep my body warm. What would you say to your patients? So that's a very, very interesting question. And there is uh, very little to no data on that. Um, and so uh, generally for things like exercising, I tell patients, if you've been exercising at a certain pace, you can probably continue that pace unless you have bleeding or something that indicates that you should stop. Um, and so I can see where that person's doctor says, well, if it's something you've been used to doing, you're probably fine. But if, you're, if this person is doing it just to improve her implantation and there's no studies right now that say this could be beneficial, um, I probably would not do it for now. I wouldn't try anything too extreme at this point in time. Right. Great. Okay. So now for all the questions that we're getting on our live chat, is it possible to increase AMH? It's a little tough to increase your AMH. Um, so um, we're born with all the eggs we will ever have. We're born with one to 2 million eggs. By the time we hit puberty, they're about 300 to 500,000. And then by menopause, they're less than a thousand. So you can't really increase your number of eggs. Um, and AMH are made by granulosa cells, um, which are cells that line the follicle where the eggs grow. Um, so it's, it's difficult to increase your actual number of eggs, um, but you can do things to increase quality. Um, so the things we mentioned, uh, diet rich in antioxidants, uh, cutting back on alcohol, those types of things. Um, now, and I, I could see where this person's coming from because the AMH tests, ideally that value declines as we increase in chronological age. But there are a few different assays uh, or ways of doing the tests that are out there. So you may go to a lab today and your number is 1.3 and you went to another lab next month and your number is two and you're like, wow, my number is increasing. Right. And it's probably not really increasing. It's probably just done differently or ran differently or processed differently by a different lab. So it's kind of tough to increase your AMH, but you can really increase or improve quality by lifestyle changes. Um, and uh, um, as physicians, sometimes in our um, diminished ovarian reserve or low egg reserve patients, we'll do add growth mm -hmm. hormone or certain other things, which we don't have really good data for, but we can mm -hmm. improve if it's something that we think can improve a patient's egg quality and give her a, a baby, we will do it. Right, right. So I have a, a question here. I have 11 eggs left. And what I think that really means is my antral follicle count is 11. I've been tracking ovulation period since March. I'm still not pregnant yet. 
what's going wrong. So what I would say is March is only two months of basically trying, but what would you say to someone who's basically just started trying for two months with a follicle count of 11, not knowing much more about them, what would you advise? So I think this person has a good egg reserve. I don't know this person's age, um, but just with a, a natural follicle count of 11, that's pretty good. So natural follicle count of about eight to 10 is about average. Um, so I think this person's doing well. Two months of trying, it, um, maybe track it for a few more months and see where it takes you. And if not, certainly it doesn't hurt to go get an evaluation to see what's mm -hmm. going on. And then uh, that uh, person can then definitely get treatment options if they want to pursue that. Perfect. Here's another question. If you have a cycle that's 40 days long, are you still ovulating? Maybe, maybe not. That's a tough one. You would have to check an ovulation predictor kit. Um, there, So typically, um, someone who has more than 35 day cycles generally are not ovulating, but we've seen late ovulation in patients. Mm -hmm. um, so it's hard to tell if someone who truly has a 40 day cycle, if they're ovulating, you would have to follow them through their cycle as a physician and do blood work and sonograms to see if they are or they can check ovulation predictor kits if they consistently have 40 day cycles. So, um, uh, you know, 40 minus 14 days and then uh, figure out when they ovulate and then try to see if they are ovulating. Yeah, and there's also a test, it's Prove test, P-R-O-O-V test.com. It's just like an ovulation predictor kit, except it measures progesterone levels basically and can be a, a nice way of doing it, especially if you don't wanna go out to a lab and, and see if you have a progesterone rise. Okay, here's another question. What are the common causes of recurrent chemical pregnancy. Any advice? My appointment has been canceled and my, the next time I'm going to see my doctor is in August. Okay, so recurrent pregnancy loss um, is uh, a difficult position for someone to be in. They're getting pregnant, they're excited, they're happy, and then they lose the pregnancy. And there are numerous causes of recurrent pregnancy loss. Um, and I don't know the, the uh, age of the person who called in with this question. Um, so the most common cause is aneuploidy or uh, embryos with uh, abnormal number of chromosomes or gene regions. Um, and, um, and so as a woman advances in chronological age, the uh, aneuploidy increases. Um, another cause of uh, recurrent uh, miscarriages uh, uterine abnormalities. So there are certain uterine abnormalities that women can be born with, a septated uterus, which has an avascular membrane dividing the uterus. And if an embryo implants on that, then uh, there's poor blood supply to the embryo, and then that can result in a miscarriage. Bicornia uterus has two horns, and it makes it difficult for the embryos to implant and grow to term. Um, but there are also abnormalities in the uterus that we can acquire during our lifetime, even if we were born with a normal uterus. So uh, fibroids, they're very common. Um, it's probably the most common gynecological pathology that women mm -hmm. see and the most common cause of hysterectomy. But those can affect a woman's ability to either implant an embryo or carry an embryo or, or pregnancy to term. Um, other abnormalities, uh, large endometrial polyps can do that. Um, scar tissue within the uterus from previous infections, previous uterine procedures uh, can lead to scar tissue. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another cause of uh, a recurrent pregnancy loss where there's a uterine abnormality. Mm -hmm. Another cause of recurrent pregnancy loss is what we call thrombophilias, or this literally means love of blood. And this means that these women are prone to clotting. And so they throw blood clots to the placenta and then that shuts off the blood supply to the embryo and then the embryo stops growing. Um, and once identified, we can treat these patients with just uh, injectable blood thinners. Right. And then the other types uh, or other causes of recurrent pregnancy loss uh, uncontrolled diabetes, uncontrolled mm -hmm. thyroid, uh, um, excessive alcohol, excessive drug use, those types of things. Many times, as much as 50% of the time, we do all the testing and the testing comes back normal for recurrent pregnancy right. loss. And that, yeah. that can be the most frustrating part is like, you really want an answer, a diagnosis. Right. This is the reason that I keep having the miscarriages and you don't get an answer because all the testing is normal. Um, but the reality is even with all the testing coming back normal, we can still help patients get pregnant with appropriate testing and appropriate treatment. Right, right. Thank you for such a thorough reply. 
I hope that whoever asked that question is really helped by your answer. Okay, I'm 40 years old. My AMH is 0.5. I have four follicles growing. They think they're going to get about two mature eggs. I want to do a second cycle. When should I do it? Right away? Wait a month? What would you say? There's no right or wrong answer to that one. Um, so you can do it right away the very next month. You could wait a month. Um, uh, so there's no right or wrong answer to it. Some women, they, their bodies do need a break. The ovaries do need some time for the, uh, what, where the follicle used to be from the previous month, just to kind of shrink back down and give the ovary some time to heal from a traumatic procedure like uh, a retrieval. But then there are other women that can do egg retrieval after egg retrieval every month and yeah. without a problem. So there's yeah. no right or wrong answer to it. And one of the things we don't, we don't have clear proof of this, but by doing psych, uh, a cycle before and then another cycle, some of the hormones that you took the previous month or even the previous two or three months prior, the follicles that you produce today were in a primordial stage three months ago, and those were also receiving the uh, growth factors from the medications you took three months ago. And so it can still be very beneficial. Yeah, I agree, especially if you were taking HGH. I think there might be a cumulative benefit perhaps. Okay, I'm 33 years old. This is going to be a hard question to answer. I have nine follicles. My AMH is 0.85, and they increased my gonal F from 300 to 450. I'm on Menopure 150. What do you think? Let's cross your fingers and hope that this, this is a cycle that works. Um, right. Uh, so going off on the dose is good. Um, yeah. And if it doesn't work, they, your physician can try a, a different protocol maybe next time to see if they can try and improve the, the number of eggs. Um, uh, but nine follicles, you know, we said average is about eight to 10. Uh, yeah. I'm keeping my fingers crossed for that person. I'm all nine, all nine make it to uh, retrieval. Absolutely. So sonohistogram is scheduled during my transfer cycle. And someone is asking, because we answered that question, should this be canceled? I do it at the very beginning sometimes. Like if your period, you know, right after your period has just ended in the transfer cycle. Sometimes I still do it. So she's asking, should she cancel her cycle? I mean, uh, should she cancel the sonohistogram? What would you do? What would you think? I, w I mean, if, if that physician or that practice is comfortable doing their saline sonograms uh, or sonohistograms at a certain time frame, and they've had a track record of excellent pregnancy success rates, then I would trust your physician to do it. Perfect. Um, does an arcuate uterus affect pregnancy rates? In theory, no. In theory, an arcuate uterus is a normal variant, and it, um, it's less than a centimeter dip in the uterus at the fundus, or uh, just a decrease in the, um, the top portion. In theory, no, it should not be an effect. Um, but if you have a septated uterus, which is a longer version of an arcuate uterus, then that can surgically be fixed prior to um, pregnancy. Excellent. How do you pick the best sperm for ICSI? How do you pick out of all the millions? How do we do it? <laughs> well, the embryologist does it. I don't have right. to do it. But I know. That's true. <laughs> they look for, they look at the, the head, the mid piece, the tail, and just kind of see which ones are moving around quite well and just pick what they think is the best one. <laughs> right. And what if the abnormality is 100%, let's say it's 100% abnormal morphology, would ICSI still work? You know, I've seen normal pregnancies result from that with a zero Kruger. So um, I would still be very hopeful that ICSI can be uh, helpful in that situation. Yeah. And then here's another question. How many times can you do an egg retrieval in your life? Well, um, I've known of patients who've done many egg retrievals because um, I've seen some very tough cases who've done 11, 12 egg retrievals before they finally went on to uh, donor egg. Mm -hmm. um, so you do need some time for your ovaries to heal. Um, the truth is, if you have the same results after four or six egg retrievals, you really want to start thinking donor egg at that point in mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Okay. I'm cycle day 10, letrozole five milligrams per day, cycle days three through seven. I have two follicles, one's at 11 and one's at 19. What would you advise for next cycle? I think one follicle is great. Uh, um, go ahead and trigger and either do time in a course or IUI. And that person did five milligrams. Is that correct? Is that what correct. you said? Yeah. yeah. I think you can try five milligrams again. Yeah. I sometimes would go up because I, I feel like maybe two eggs would be more worth that patient's while. So maybe alternate three, two, three, two, three. So yeah. they're not going to ovulate, right. <laughs> you know, three eggs and maybe two, because you never know. You're right. Sometimes it's two, sometimes it's one, even on, yeah. um, even on the same five milligrams. 
exactly. Yeah. Same dose. Okay. We're almost done with our questions. Um, so thank you again, Dorette, for being on. Before we close, though, I want you to also tell us where we can find your books because we're getting that question too, where people can buy your books. But here's going to be our last question. I have uterine didelphus. What should I look for? Or what should the doctor look for when choosing which uterus to use? And would you recommend acupuncture before and after the transfer? So that's a, that's a very good question. Um, so if there if one horn is larger or one is more accessible for the doctor, I would recommend using that horn because that the embryo has has a better chance of making it to term in a bigger horn. Um, and then acupuncture certainly um, is not a contraindication before and after um, transfer. Great. Okay. So where can our audience members find your book? Oh, absolutely. My uh, uh, URL is www.noorhasan.com. Awesome. Well, thank you again for your time. I mean, we could probably be here for hours and still get so many questions. So I really appreciate all the time you took to answer um, everyone's question today. And I hope you'll come back again for another live Q&A. Will you come back? Oh, absolutely. Okay, <laughs> this awesome. is fun. I love this. <laughs> I could talk thank about you, it all the time. Me too. <laughs> so we'll have to schedule this again. Well, thank you for your time. I really appreciate you and have a wonderful weekend. Okay. Have a good weekend. Okay. Bye. Thank Bye, you. Everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.